So today, what we will do is we'll look at electric network transfer functions. This is week two, lecture two. So electric network transfer functions. Uh, but I'll also do uh, transfer functions, TFs. But first, I'll do the homework one problem. I've looked through it, uh, homework one, problem one, and I want to look at this problem because it's an interesting problem. It's basically asking you to come up. So the concept is to obtain the transfer function of a transducer. And this is something you will see. So what's a transducer? It converts from one domain to the other. For example, a microphone is a transducer, right? Right now, it's already my voice, sound waves, right? compressions and rarefactions into uh, electrical, electronic signal, yes? That's an example, a speaker is a transducer, which is the inverse of a microphone, yes? I mean, a speaker can also double as a microphone, but anyway, the transducer we are dealing with is a potentiometer, and this is a classic transducer in the sense it converts rotations, theta i of t, Oh, as a total aside, as opposed to as quote unquote feedback, have you been looking at my YouTube lectures or no? Anybody? Is it helpful or no? Okay, all right, then okay. Let me know if I have to do something different. Like it asks me to reduce the quality for like streaming. I've done that, but then the, you can't really see my writing. So unless you're using like a 56K modem, it should be like fine in terms of speed. So. I mean, I just came back from India, like, oh, I mean, no offense, but India, like, everywhere there's like broadband. I mean, I was in my native village and uh, there was this one person with a laptop with like a little uh, equivalent of Verizon dongle looking at a uh, English Premier League game. So yeah, go figure, right? So, all right. So the thing is, uh, here is my input, theta i. So that's in radians, okay? Output is voltage. So it converts rotations. It basically measures rotation. That's all it is, right? With a potentiometer. So everybody familiar with the part, right? Potentiometer. So, all right. So the question is basically determine the gain of the transducer. So let's call that KP. The input is theta i of t. So there's no transfer function here per se in the sense this is actually simply the gain KP. V out of T, okay? So the most important thing, I guess, in like when you look at transducers is the dimensions. So the dimension here is radian, okay? And the dimension here is volts. So in other words, our solution, the dimensions, that's what this notation means. Okay, this means dimensions. Or units should be volts per radian. Is that clear? Of course, we're ignoring all nonlinearities in the part, such as backlash. So where I used this before is for a ankle sensor on a bipedal robot. And the problem we had was the potentiometer backlash would actually give us spurious angles. And in that case, we would take uh, the backlash into account. Right? So do you have to take the backlash into account? It depends on your application. All right, so conceptually, what we need to do is we need to convert first our turns to radians, okay? So what the potentiometer we look at is the turns of the pot, right? I think it's given its, what is it? Uh, is it a 10 turn pot? I think it's a 10 turn pot, it is? Okay, thank you. So we have a 10 turn potentiometer or part, okay, in one turn, so how many, so if I turn the part once, how many turns do you think we're going to have in, sorry, in one turn, how many radians do you think we're going to have? Uh, well, exactly, 2 pi, all right, in one turn, note that, and that's, 
you can think about it actually as an assumption, but that's a valid assumption to make, right? In the sense, the parts we are you should visualize is not your little um, uh, the turn part. It's the bigger part with like you know what I'm talking about, the one which has the handle like sticking out. So that's the kind of part we are thinking about, right? It's easier to interface to, especially when I used like an I uh, used it for an ankle sensor, right? Ankle turn sensor. In one turn, note that we have two pi radians. Okay. So this is let's say this is one. These the uh, this fact one. That is we have a ten turn part, and in one turn we have two pi radians. Now we have hundred volts developing across 10 turns yes how do i know it's 100 volts yeah fifty, negative 50 to 50 right across 10 turns so this is number two one and two imply and when i do this implication i'm also doing an assumption that counterclockwise turns this is just an assumption or positive so this is my abbreviation or not mine the math abbreviation for positive plus ve okay and that's a valid assumption to make because mathematically counterclockwise is positive so let's say you're interfacing this to some other de this device which you usually do that designer he or she should assume that counterclockwise is positive okay. or you should ask like what's your assumption or look at the data sheet etc is that clear so one and two imply that V out as a function of time is I have a theta in as a function of time, which is in radians. So I have 100 volts per 10 turns, but I have two pi radians in one turn. Okay, so let me just write this out neatly. Is that clear? The dimensions. Okay. So there is two voltage, there is the number of turns, and there is two pi radians for every turn. And counterclockwise is positive. Okay. So in other words, this implies V out of T is 10 over 2 pi theta I of T. So my Kp is 10 over 2 pi volt per radian. Okay. So does this make sense? We have to check. Let's check. First of all, does the derivation make sense? Okay. So how do you check if this is correct given this picture? Huh? Yeah, put a value in. Uh, so what is one obvious value you can put in and check? Even more obvious than that. Zero. Okay, so if you put in zero, V out is zero, and that kind of makes sense because if the if it's zero turns, the part is centered. Okay, it's zero volts, and looking at this, it should be approximately zero. Yes, between fifty and minus fifty. Now, if it's zero turns here and the total is ten turns, how many turns do I have in the counterclockwise direction and the clockwise direction? Five. Okay. So I have five turns counterclockwise. I'm pointing up because I'm looking at the part uh, towards the. I'm looking at towards the shaft. Okay. If I look at it like this, this is counterclockwise. Yes. So that's why I'm pointing up. But whatever. So if I have five turns in this direction, how many total radians do I have? Ten pi. So if you plug in ten pi here, what do you get for v out? 50 volts is that clear and then we assumed that clockwise is negative so you have minus 5 times 2 pi yes negative 50 volts in the clockwise direction and that's correct is that clear you should always check or right? you can't just blindly write this and say oh you're done no 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 all right you should check you should think when you're writing and once you're done you should check okay is this clear so this was supposed to be a tough problem in the homework if you haven't seen it if you got this kudos okay it's in the book like it's he it, it talks about it a little bit but 
this is the kind of derivation you should go over and my I'll just call this note one when I save it node one nope okay and the second problem in the in the homework uh, let's see, note two. in homework one should be pretty straightforward it's just simply an RL circuit so I'm not going to cover that I'm going to unless you have questions on it so any questions on that RL circuit? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, uh, what was the circuit? I, don't, I think it's voltage. Was this the one? Was that a switch somewhere? No. Okay. Oh, it was V of T here? Okay. That's good. So because it's U of T basically is very important because that not only models the switch closing at t equals zero, you need the u of t because if this is a constant, right, which I think it is, it's one, okay, it's just u of t, thank you. So it's one u of t. The Laplace transform of one u of t is one over s, okay? The Laplace transform of one is not one over s. It's not defined for us, okay? Is that clear? So this u of t is very important or what you have to do is you have to say, oh, I have one volt with the switch closing at t equals zero. But the switch closing at t equals zero, you cannot model in MATLAB, for example. Okay, you can model the switch closing in multisim, but mathematically, that's what the U of t is. Okay, very important. So here is I of t. Okay, so I think it asks you. Let's see, I have some notes here. Set up differential equations. Uh, describing circuit B solve for I of T if V of T is U of T okay okay so in general will and there is no initial current in the inductor In the inductor so this was homework one problem two and the question asked was how do I do the plot because so the question is uh, symbolic uh, parameters so there's no numbers how do I do the plot I plot the answer as we will do is uh, we need a uh, let's see qualitatively accurate plot that is as you will see you need to capture like the main features that is it's a first order system and it settles to the steady state in five time constants okay so you have to and initially the current is zero so that's what you have to do so let's just do that quickly uh, since it was asked so first of all, set up differential equations describing the circuit. So uh, okay, let's just do this. I'm going to put this back as V of T. And then we'll say V of T equals U of T. V of T is IR, okay, plus what is he asking for? Uh, I, right, I think for describing the circuit. So VL, which is the voltage across the inductor, yes? So VL is L di dt. So this is IR plus L di dt is V of T with I of zero minus being I initial and this is the differential equation describing the circuit okay so what I'm gonna do is what is he asking for solve for I of T so here I of T let's say he asks for any voltage and stuff you can find the current for example if he asks for the voltage across the inductor you can find the current through the inductor and then say VL is L D I D T Okay, so B is, so V of T is U of T, okay, this imply, and I of 0 minus is 0, so this implies that IR plus L D I D T is U of T, and I of L 0 minus is 0, okay, I'm going to do this in the Laplace domain, 
because that's what we're going to go towards. But if you want to do this in the classic way, stop by my office and we'll do it. Okay. Because I want to practice. I want you to start practicing this. So if I take the Laplace transform, this is a function of time. So you get I of s. All is a constant. L times s i of s. Let me just write i of zero minus. So you know that it's there, but this is zero. Okay. Equals Laplace transform of u of s is one over s. Yes. So he's asking for i of s. This implies. Let's see. I of s times r plus s l equals one over s. Yes. So this is I of s. He's asking for I of s, right? I of t. That's what he's asking for. Or he's asking for v. I. Okay, he's asking for i. All right. Uh, let's see. S times s l plus r. Okay. This implies I of s is let's see you factor out an uh, 1 over l s times s plus r over l yes so then you can do a quick partial fraction expansion of this 1 over s minus 1 over s plus r over l yes uh, let's see i think i'm chuk, 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 chuk. so what do i need here so if i take the common denominator here i get r over l in the numerator, so I need a 1 over r. Yes? Correct? So I claim that the partial fraction expansion of this is this. How did I get that quickly? You put this under the common denominator. Okay, denominator is s times s plus r over l, which is what you have here. Yes? The numerator will be s plus r over l minus s. Correct? So the numerator will be r over l, but I don't want an r. I want 1 over l. So I have a 1 over r to cancel that r. Is this clear or do you want me to do this uh, by using partial fractions? Okay, it's clear? All right. Okay, so that's, well, we're done. In the sense, if I take the inverse Laplace transform of this, I get i of t is 1 over r. You get a u of t from here, 1 over s, which is the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s is u of t. This fellow is e to the minus r over l times t. Okay? So on the time constant, tau is l over r. Correct? So and that makes sense because this is t over tau. Yes? Well, I'll write it like that so it's clear. So u of t. And so i of t is 1 over r times. 1 minus e to the minus t o l over r. Okay? I write it like this because this shows you clearly that tau is l over r, which it should be. Okay? Times u of t. Again, check please. First of all, the dimensions. Okay? Always do a dimension check. What are the dimensions of this? What are the dimensions of this? Uh, this. Sorry? Sorry? This is unitless, right? This is seconds, this is seconds. No units here, no units here. Yes? What are the units of this? Volts. What are the units of this? Ohms. Is I V over R? Yes. If you screw up anywhere here, it's wrong. Okay? It gives no way it can be right. Yeah. Question? Wait, with non-zero initial conditions? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, this is zero initial condition, so this cancelled out. Okay. Yeah. So question was, can I just use one and put for t greater than or equal to zero? You can. The point is of using u of t is it mat it's a compact mathematical notation which allows you to simulate it. In for example, MATLAB. So let's say you were simulating this in MATLAB. It's much easier to say this is equal to u of t than saying it's equal to 1 for t greater than or equal to 0. That's all. Okay. Is that clear? So yes, you can do that. But when you try to simulate this in MATLAB, it will be more difficult. Like Mathematica can handle that. You can actually give piecewise linear functions in Mathematica. You don't have to use u of t. I don't know about MATLAB. 
So in Mathematica, you can actually type for t greater than or equal to 0 and it will understand it. So the reason why you use u of t is for mathematical conciseness. That's all. Number one. Number two, let's say you're doing the Laplace transform. You need this u of t. Okay? That's the other. That's, uh, you, I could say, more important. Because the Laplace transform of u of t is 1 over s. So let's say you wrote for t greater than or equal to 0. When you eventually practice enough, you'll be like, oh, wait, I have to write that as u of t. Okay? So good questions. Any other question? Okay, so we checked units. Let's check initial conditions. At t equals 0, what is this? What does this come out to? 0. So is that right? Yeah. That's what we had. Okay. t going to infinity, can you check? t turning to infinity, what does this entire expression boil down to? What does this boil down to? Okay, this entire thing to 1. Correct, this is to 0. Okay. So at t going to infinity, it's saying the current through the circuit is u over r. Is that right? Yeah, it is. At steady state, the inductor behaves like a short circuit. No, that's right. Okay. So dimensions, initial conditions, definitely. If you can, final conditions. Okay. All right. Now the plot. Okay. So let's look at the plot. So in this case, like I mentioned, you can just do a qualitative plot. So in the sense, for t less than 0, this fellow was at 0. Okay. For t greater than 0, this fellow started rising up, and the shape is very important. It has to be like this. Okay. At steady state, you have u over r. Yes, so 1 over r, 1 volt over r. So you could make this as amps, this in seconds. And let's see, tau, 2 tau, 3 tau, 4 tau, 5 tau. So in 5 time constants, it's right there. And tau is defined as L over R. That's all I was looking for in a plot. That's it. Okay. Qualitative but accurate. Okay? All right. So, now what we're going to do is electric network transfer function. So, this actually comes in nicely. So, there's actually section 2.4 in your book. Uh, electric network transfer functions. So what is useful for you is table 2.3 on page 48. Let me see if I can be an expert and copy this. This is why I should keep my keyboard active. I don't have to do all this scrolling thing. Fourteen table. Remind me to keep my keyboard active. Come on. No, come on, come on. Don't crash. Forty five. Six, seven, here, oh, almost got it. Okay, that's fine. Let's keep the keyboard in there. What page number is this? Can't tell. Ah. Forget it. Okay, so this is, doesn't really work. I have not fifty seven. All right, fine. Let me just write out the table. Close. Oh, don't tell me you crashed. Oh, no. Oh, well. Got to get the real keyboard out. I used to have a Linux tablet which died, which I had no problems with. Like this one. So if you have your book, go to page 48. And that's the table we're going to discuss. Uh, let's see. Note one. No, that's the one. Unfortunately, I can't close this thing. 
close, close, die. Right. So let me pause the lecture. Oh man, that also died. All right. So let's see. Hopefully, nope. So, good news is uh, yeah, looks like my screen died, which is not good. Alright, so what I gotta do is I have to close this. I don't wanna close it. Uh, how do I get my screen back? My touch interface died. Alright, fine. Uh, looks like I have to use the board. That's okay. Uh, let's close this. Close. short technical difficulty so this is the table that's pretty important so let's look at this okay and this is a table I will not give you on the exam because this is, this is something you should know as electrical engineers if not from 2070 from 3050 for sure all right let's look at this so here is the let's look at the simpler component if you will the resistor so V equals IR okay uh, so if you take the Laplace transform, so let's do this one by one. So let's do the number one resistor, okay? So V equals IR, the linear resistor. V and I are functions of time. If you take the Laplace transform on both sides, you get V of S equals I of S times R, yes? So this implies your impedance Z of S, which is defined as V of S over I of S, and that should be obvious to you that this is the impedance, okay, from your previous courses. But you will see we'll also define an equivalent impedance for the mass spring damper, like translational mechanical systems, rotational mechanical systems, etc. Okay. So this is R. Yes. So in the case of the mass spring damper, your impedance should be what? What should the equivalent, if you think about it, of R be for a mass spring damper? The damper okay so so we'll appropriately appropriately define what the voltage and the current is in terms of the mechanical quantities such that your impedance is the damping okay so that actually if i remember right just or just thinking about it that may not lead to a intuitive definition for voltage and current mechanically but we'll see when we get to it so this is number one uh, the resistor and you can see that the impedance is R, the admittance, which you must have heard of in 2070 is the reciprocal of the impedance. Well, that's all it is. That's how it's defined as. It's 1 over R. Now for a capacitance, or a capacitor, linear capacitor, I equals C dV dt, okay? If you take the Laplace transform, I of S is S C of S, okay? writing c times s v of s i was thinking about something else so v of zero minus okay we are looking at transfer function relationships so we assume that this is zero so this implies what do we want uh, v of s over i of s is one over sc so the impedance is one over sc and that's right there so the admittance is sc okay So in other words, it's telling you that if I put a current in here, the voltage is the integral of the current. Okay, it just sums the amount of charges flowing through it. You can see that from the time domain, V is integral 1 over C of I, 
where v is 1 over c times integral of i, correct? At what also comes out in the Laplace domain, you should do all these quick checks. 1 over s is the integral, okay? And the constant is also there. And correspondingly, we have the relationships for an inductor. And these units down here, you should know about, right? So let's start doing some problems. So we have 20 minutes. So I'll do some problems. Again, uh, you should practice more on your own so you become better at this, okay? So let's see, how do I? So here is an example which you should go through. Let me try to do a different one, the skill assessment exercise. Wow, where is the skill assessment exercise? So and also you can do mesh analysis, et cetera, which you should have done in 2070. I'll try to do an example. Okay. Well, where is it? A problem solving technique. Oh, it's maybe it includes op amps as well. Uh, the skill assessment exercise. Let's take a look. Non-inverting amplifier. Ah, yes. So here is two seven. So let's copy this down. Let's do this, and I'll do other problems as well. If Z one of S is the impedance of a ten microfarad capacitor, and Z two of S is the impedance of a hundred kilo ohm resistor, find the transfer function if these components are used as an inverting ampli operational amplifier and non-inverting operational amplifier. Okay. So usually Z two is the feedback impedance. Okay, that's the notation. But let's just make sure the book is doing. Yeah, here it is. Z two is the feedback impedance. Okay. So let's draw, so let's do the non-inverting. Oh, no, he's asking inverting first. So A, inverting. Okay, so what's the inverting amplifier configuration? You remember? So this is grounded. It's negative feedback. So here is Z1 of S. And here is Z2 of S. Here is V naught of S, and here is V in of S. Okay? And this you should, like, this is not something I'll give it on the test because you should know this. Okay. Electrical engineers, you know what an inverting amplifier is. Okay, what about non inverting? Yeah, so you switch the input, so just make sure the feedback is still negative. because we're working with this acting as an amplifier. V naught of S, so this becomes V in of S. Yes, and then this is grounded, okay? So it's asking, uh, what's the G of S, the transfer function or the gain? So what do you think is the transfer function of this guy? Yeah, it'll be a voltage divided on Z2 because there's no current going in here, Chris is right. But do you remember from your 2050, Z2 over Z1 with a negative sign, okay? Yeah, that's inverting. Is that clear? So what's he given as Z2? Is the Z2 is the impedance of a 100K resistor. So that's just 100 times 10 to the third, yes? Over uh, Z1 is the impedance of a 10 microfarad capacitor. So it's 1 over S times 10 microfarads, right? So it's 10 times 10 to the negative 6, and G of S is dimensionless, because in the S domain, this is impedance. This is also impedance, okay? So what's this? Let's see, I computed it. Let's see, 10, 10, multiply and divide by 10. Is this simply, let's see, this is all just cancel. 10 to the 6th, multiply and divide by 10 to the negative 6, 3, 10. Yeah, isn't this just negative S? Uh, let's call this G1 of S. 
or GA of us. Okay. Isn't this just negative S? Let's see. If you multiply and divide by 10 to the negative 6th, that cancels this guy. That's uh, 10 to the negative 6th times 10 to the 3rd gives you 10 to the negative 3rd. Okay? Which is 0 0.1, which is 1 over 10, which cancels this 10 here. Yeah, it's negative S. Negative S for the inverting amplifier. The book is right. Yeah. Alright, let's do this guy. And you should not make mistakes in this algebra. Okay, that's like kitty stuff. Right? Uh, GB of S, 1 plus Z2 over Z1. And always check your answer, okay, in the sense algebra mistakes creep in for every one of us. But, uh, okay, how do you check this answer algebraically? If you actually, uh, so let's do this. Uh, let's. This should help us check the algebra. This is a 10 microfarad capacitor. Yes. This is a 100k resistor. You can definitely check if the form of your transfer function is correct. Okay. So if it's negative s, forget the negative sign for now. In the time domain, what is this operation equivalent to? Remember from last lecture? Huh? No, it's not constant voltage. It's an operation. It's, no. So in other words, V naught is S times V in. Yes? No, U of T is 1 over S. But it's, there's not a, is a transfer function. So what's the, what operation is this? Where do you get S times something else? We've been doing this all along. So it is telling me that you're not mindful of what we're doing. You gotta be mindful of what we're doing. So go back here. Remember this. This. So where did we see S times something over here? No, not in the resistor. Derivative. So what kind of an operation is this? So V out is going to be what? In terms of V in, what is it going to be? So V out is. So if S times something is the derivative, V out is negative S V in. Correct? So V out of T is going to be? No. So V out, this implies V out over V in is negative S. Correct? So this implies V out is minus S V in. Correct? V out of S if you want to be more specific because I want to take the inverse Laplace transform shortly. So that means V out of T is going to be what in terms of V in of T? Yeah, negative derivative. Negative dVid T and you should now never forget that this is the configuration for a differentiating op amp. In other words, this capacitor acts as a DC blocker. Okay, this is a DC blocker circuit. Never forget this. Okay. So that will let you know if you got this correctly. If you got 1 over S here, it's wrong because it's not an integrator. So when you're doing algebra, you should be not only algebra, anything else, you should be mindful okay, of what you're doing. Of course, you should, you should also be motivated to like this. And so we already computed what Z2 over Z in is, Z1 is here. Okay, It is just S. So this comes with a, it's 1 plus S, GB of S, and let's check if this is correct. 1 plus S, okay? And basically, it's very interesting, okay? Uh, well, actually, it's not very interesting because uh, basically, here, your Z1 is still the capacitor. So this is still acting as a differentiator, but it's an offset because of the uh, non-inverting configuration. Let's say I want to make this an integrator. Go back here. How would I make this as an integrator? What would I do to these two components? Switch them. And you will get a transfer function as negative 1 over S. You can check. That's an integrator. All right, so any questions on this? 
we still have 10 minutes so i'll do one more problem like it's a let's see after this we are starting translational mechanical functions so not there i saw a couple of other nice problems so let's go back in there and this method of sum of impedances which you might have done when you did mesh analysis and stuff it's not it's very algorithmic and it doesn't really give you insight into the problem i will cover this for mechanical systems okay but it's easier just to understand intuitively what's going on figure out the number of degrees of freedom for the mechanical system and just write out the equations again this is all very formulaic and algorithmic all right so uh, the best uh, way for you to get this algorithm or to not make mistakes in algebra is just practice more there's the there's no you can be as motivated as you want to do math which is important which you need first but that is not a substitute for doing problems because that's the way you fix algebra mistakes or sorry you minimize algebra mistakes all right so let's see find the ramp response for a system whose stress do this for the hell of it okay find the ramp response and then we'll call it quits because we have time let's do another one find the ramp response for a system whose transfer function is blah right so the solution so the transfer function is this that means y of s is the output x of s is the input is s over s plus 4 times s plus 8 okay now we want ramp response so your x of s is the laplace transform of the ramp function okay so in other words your x of t looks like this x of t is t u of t ramp okay so what's the laplace transform of the ramp okay think how do you get the ramp okay you know the laplace transform of the unit step u of t right what's the laplace transform of the unit step if you don't know that you're in trouble so what huh one over s okay how do you get the ramp from the step what mathematical operation do you do So let's say I have, huh? Yeah, it'll be integration, right? So here is one, and there's a discontinuity here. So you integrate, you get this fellow, correct? Integration in the time domain is equivalent to what in the Laplace domain? One over s. So in other words, if the u of s is one over s, and this integration is equivalent to multiplying by one over s. What's the Laplace transform of this? Yeah, it's one over s squared, and you can check it is one over s squared. Okay. So this is just one over s squared. Is that clear? And mine just crashed. There it goes. Completely gone. So. Oh wow! Something else crashed. <laughs> All right. So it's one over s squared. see okay so let's see how much time do we have we still have 6 minutes so let's try to get this done yeah. it's 1 over s squared all right uh, so is this setup clear now we do our usual partial fraction expansion so oh it's very easy oh it's too easy okay s plus 8 So therefore, probably try eyeballing it, but let's just do this. Is a over s plus b over s plus four plus c over s plus eight? Yes. So why don't you finish it on paper without looking at what I'm doing? That's hard. S plus four, and I'll finish it here. S plus eight plus b times s times s plus eight plus c times s times s plus four. So let me pass the lecture. Get back to it. Okay, so getting back, so this is what I got. So s equals negative four implies you can find b as negative one over sixteen. S equals negative eight implies you can find find c as one over thirty two, and s equals zero implies you can find a. You don't have to compare any coefficients. You can if you want. 
Therefore, just taking the inverse Laplace transform, 1 over S inverse Laplace transform is U of T with the, off, uh, with the gain of 1 over 32, A. S, 1 over S plus 4 inverse Laplace transform is E to the minus 4 T U of T. And uh, inverse Laplace transform of 1 over S plus 8 is E to the minus 8 T, okay? So, and with the appropriate coefficients, and that's what the book has. Now, something I want to point out, which is apparently uh, one of your fellow classmates in this course told me that it wasn't emphasized in 20, 2070, at least in his section. And this U of T is very important, okay? Because you have, our dynamics takes place only after, in our case, T equals zero. Let's say if it's U of T minus A, that means it takes some time before the dynamic starts, right? If this U of T were not there, what would happen? You can plug in T less than zero and get non-zero values here. But that's not what happens, okay? Because there's something which happened in your system, that is your system was at steady state before all the dynamics happened. And that's why this U of T is very, very important. Or as was mentioned, you have to write T greater than or equal to zero. This, equa this expression is not valid for t less than zero. That's my point. Okay, and U of t is uh, mathematically very elegant. Number one. Number two, the Laplace transform of U of t is uh, 1 over s. Okay? So it doesn't make sense to ignore the U of t, and I don't know why your book does it. Okay. So that's about it for this lecture. So next time, we'll start translational mechanical systems. Uh, you sh again, you should practice this more because the electrical might seem easy. It should be easy. The mechanical is a little iffy in the sense you have to be careful of the signs. Okay. So just visualize how it, the systems move or rotate and it will be easy. All right. See you next time.